opportunity to expose you and myself to the stage of this work that I'm doing tentatively called The Foreigner's Home. Um, with attention drawn to the apostrophe S. Uh, and whether or not it is a possessive or a contraction. That the foreigner is home. Or the question of the foreigner's home. This one, this aspect of that topic, for me, begins with um, the construction in my mind of the language about the foreigner or the foreigner's own language. But in the beginning, I just want to distribute some comments <clears throat> about a topic that is too large, in fact, for this address and perhaps even for the larger work that I'm doing. But it seemed to me that coming to this conference, I could continue to explore these questions because the nature of the conference established here. Um, questions about knowledge uh, are as old as knowledge. Uh, questions about human behavior are probably younger than the questions about knowledge. But in any case, we are still confounded by the same dilemma, uh, the same conflict, the same crisis posed in this conference as the question between, of the difference between, the separation between, the gulf between culture and science, or in some sense, science and art. And the question is, are they married? Or just engaged? Or perhaps they're still just flirting with one another? Or perhaps we don't know it, but they're already divorced. Well, we know they met. <laughs> because they were both born in the same neighborhood. Probably the same house, which is the house of magic. Magic exists as the origin and the root of both. And they may have left that house. They may have gotten divorced and exited by each one's own group, but I am convinced that they remember that old neighborhood. But whatever their relationship, we can phrase the same question another way with a hint of ethical knowledge. What are we to think of ourselves? What are we to do? about ourselves. The question exists because side by side with the astonishing leaps humans have made, have achieved and continue to achieve in technology and science, cheek by jowl is the horror humans are capable of imagining and activating. <laughs> and our instincts seem to be as primitive as were those of our scaled or hirsute ancestors, if not, as I am persuaded, perhaps more primitive, because we have less reason to have them. Our brains are bigger, our cognitive powers far more sophisticated, Yet our minds are still capable of accepting and inventing newer forms of debasement and cruelty. 
And I would like to believe this conflict is an adoration rather than a condition. <coughs> but the justifications for causing or ignoring misery are flagrant. And the mechanisms, mechanisms of suffering and torture are exquisite. And I haven't got any solutions to the problems engendered by the embrace of the vile and the intelligent. But I have a suspicion that the intimacy they continue to share is neither inevitable nor natural. More ways change. What was unspeakable 50 years ago becomes popular, and what was common practice 50 years ago becomes unthinkable. What's well, easy to and common to believe that vileness or evil is also ignorance. But just suppose it isn't. Just suppose it's also intellectual if not intelligent. Well, it's hard for me as a writer not to see these, what I see as a collapse of human intelligence and human corruption as failures of the imagination and the consequences of that, the failure of language, the seduction of the easily achieved glamour of the vocabulary of violence and the etymology of demons who, we insist, inspire it. All this during a period in which, other than at the height of the slave trade, the mass movement of peoples is greater than it's ever been. It's a movement of executives, laborers, intellectuals, refugees, diplomats, immigrants, artists, armies, crossing oceans and continents, through customs offices and hidden routes, in private jets and cargo vans, speaking multiple languages of trade, of poverty, of political intervention, of persecution, of exile, of wealth. We are sharing the illnesses and the genes and the progeny and the culture. And there's little doubt that the redistribution, voluntary or involuntary, of people all over the globe tops the agenda of the state the boardrooms, the neighborhoods, and the street. Political maneuvers to restrain this movement are not limited to monitoring the dispossessed. While a lot of this movement or exodus can be described as the journey of the colonized to the seat of the colonizers, and while more of it is the flight and desperation of refugees, in fact, the relocation and transplantation of the management and diplomatic class to globalization's outposts, as well as the deployment of fresh military units and new bases features pop feature prominently in the legislative attempts to manage the constant flow of people the newly housed from home, the unhoused looking for, evicted from home, each and all carrying an idea of home, the place where one belongs. So the spectacle of mass movement draws our attention inevitably to the borders, the poorest places, the vulnerable points where one's concept of home 
is seen as being menaced by foreigners. Much of the alarm that hovers at the borders, the gates, is stoked by both the threat and the promise of globalism and an uneasy relationship with our own foreignness, our own rapidly disintegrating sense of belonging in the wake of globalism. The cachet of this unfortunate term notwithstanding, it disguises both the sublime and the predatory. Globalism has the same desires and yearnings as its predecessors, empire, manifest destiny, internationalism, universalism, whatever. Because it too understands itself as historically progressive, enhancing, destined, unifying, and even utopian. Narrowly defined, it, of course, it's meant to mean instant movement of capital and the rapid distribution of data and products operating within the neutral, politically neutral environment shaped by multinational corporate demands. But its larger connotations are not quite so innocent, encompassing as they do not only the demonization of embargoed states, <coughs> the trivialization of human life in whole areas of the world, the negotiated support for despots and political bandits, preemptive wars in the interests of national slash economic security. Not only those things in the larger definition, but also uh, putting signed, stamped, to the collapse of nations, nation states under the weight of transnational economies, transnational capital, and transnational labor, along with the preeminence of Western culture and economy. It's also partly the Americanization of the developed and developing world through the penetration of principally the United States culture into other cultures, as well as the marketing of third world countries into the West as fashion, film sets, and cuisine. <coughs> Globalization hailed with the same vigor as was manifest destiny, internationalism, and so on. How has reached a level of majesty in our imagination. For all its claims of fostering democracy, globalism's dispensations are royal, for it can bestow much in matters of reach, across frontiers, in terms of mass, as we mentioned, populations affected and engaged, and in terms of riches, limitless fields to mine, for resources, limitless services to offer. Yet, as much as globalism is adored as near messianic, it's also reviled as an evil, courting a dangerous dystopia. It's disregard of borders, national infrastructures, local bureaucracies, internet censors, tariffs, laws, and languages. It's impatience of margins and the marginal people who live there. Its formidable engulfing properties, accelerating erasure, encouraging the flattening out of difference of specificity for marketing purposes. And some of us fear indistinguishability, the elimination of minority languages, minority cultures in its way. Others of us speculate with disgust and alarm on what could be the irrevocable, enfeebling alteration of major languages, major cultures in its sweep. 
even if those dreaded consequences are not made completely manifest, they nevertheless cancel out globalism's assurances of better life by issuing dire warnings of premature cultural death. It's the rattling sound of this threat of cultural death that I believe enshrines our concept of the foreign and reveals an uneasiness with our own feelings of foreignness having ourselves turned into foreigners in our own land, our own rapidly fraying sense of belonging. To what do we pay greatest allegiance? Family, language, language group, culture, country, nation, gender, race, religion? And if we don't pay close allegiance to any of those, are we then urbane? cosmopolitan, or simply lonely. Contemplating the trans-global tread of peoples can make us cling maniacally to our own cultures, languages, while dismissing others, can make us rank evil according to whatever the fashion of the day is, can make us legislate and expel, conform, purge, and pledge allegiance to ghosts, fantasies, of what our past is. <coughs> Most of all, the pressure of globalism can make us deny the foreigner in ourselves and make us resist to the death the commonness of humanity. While cultural reinvigoration is beckoning, beckoning in the smile of globalism, we detect in its breath annihilation of cultures. And the language crafted to display one or the other, the smile or the breath, a familiar yet faux language of rule, of deception, of force, seeps into the most steadfast consciousnesses. Yet knowing that language speaks us as much as we speak it, Artists, humanists, are compelled to inquire into those thought processes and merge, even define, human progress with or by human gravity. The marriage of the human and the intellect. <clears throat> when I spoke a moment ago about the failure of imagination and its consequences, the failure of language, I was reminded of efforts after major wars to change the language. After World War I, World War I poets decided not to write poetry anymore, those who had experienced that war. Novelists began to question the validity of a word like honor. Courage. <coughs> Whether it was Ernest Hemingway with those serious questions, or Wilfred Owen with his, the military language began to lose its power. <coughs> then came the Second War with other precedents and other reasons. And what surfaced was the powerful, rousing, stirring language of war. And we still adore, revere, and are moved by the best speeches in whatever language that stir us to kill. <clears throat> then there came another language that was robust, popularly robust, and uh, demanding and moving. And it was the language of reconciliation, 
the language spoken by Gandhi, by Martin Luther King, by Nelson Mandela, and it was ennobling. Now we are in the age of what I can only call the punious language, these are the war. So I want to press this point with the illustration of imagination, triumph, or failing in the hands of an artist. And I'm taking my text from the 11th century and the 20th. From medieval Europe, and the modern American Midwest. And I'm hoping to summon your reflection on contemporary events and the disabling rhetoric that accompanies these events. And I'm hoping you can discover in the lines of association I am making with the medieval sensibility and a modern one, fertile terrain on which we can appraise the possibilities of the 21st century. The first involves the saga of a pure, unpolluted, unsullied concept of the demon, the man-eating demon of unprecedented cruelty and a parallel appetite, who ravaged generally at night and <clears throat> focused primarily on the people of one place. But it was only because he chose to do that. He clearly could slaughter whomever and wherever he decided to. His name was Grendel. And he spent at least a dozen years dismembering, chewing, swallowing the livestock, the citizens, the veins of Scandinavia. And the leader of the country, of course, lived in a palace with his queen, his family, friends, guards, councils, and a grand army of heroes. But every night when the leader went to bed, guards and warriors were stationed to protect the palace from its and the palace and its inhabitants from destruction and to try if at all possible slay their nighttime enemy. But each night, the demon, Grendel, picked them off as though they were ripe cherries on an eternally fruited tree. So the kingdom was sunk in mourning and helplessness, riven with sorrow for the dead, with regret for the past, fear of the future. They were according to the poet, hooped within the great seal of necessity, enthralled to a code of loyalty and bravery, bound to seek glory in the eye of the warrior world. Little nations are grouped around their lord. The greater nations spoil for war and menace the little ones. The lord dies defenselessness ensues, the enemy strikes. Vengeance for the dead become an epic for the living. Bloodshed begets further bloodshed. The wheel treads, the generations tread, and tread, and tread. But what never seemed to worry them the poet of the saga, or the population of the castle. But who was this guy? Who is this demon, and why had he placed them on his menu? The question is never put. And it's never put for some reason, because demons don't have fathers. Evil has no father. It's preternatural and exists without explanation. Grendel's actions are dictated by his nature, the nature of an alien mind, 
and inhuman drift. He's the essence of the one who loathes you, wants you not just dead, but nourishingly so, so that your death provides gain to the slayer, food, land, wealth, water, whatever, like genocide, like ethnic cleaning, like mass murder, or individual assault for profit. But this is not the case, because this demon escapes all these reasons. Nobody attacked him or offended him. No one tried to invade his home or displace him from his territory. No one had stolen from him or visited any wrath upon him. So he wasn't defending himself, nor seeking vengeance. He wasn't angry. He didn't want to rule Scandinavia or the North. He didn't want to plunder their resources or rape their women. So obviously, there could be no reasoning with him. No bribery, no negotiations, no begging. No trading, nothing could stop him. Humans, even at their most corrupt, selfish, and ignorant, can be made available to reason, or are educable, retrainable, and most important, fathomable. Humans have words for madness, explanations for evil, and a system of payback for those who trespass or are judged out but Grindel's beyond comprehension, unfathomable. That's the ultimate monster, the ultimate demon, mindless, without <coughs> intelligible speech. In the illustrations that imagine him <coughs> and the language that describes him, he is ugly, hairy. His body is folded in on itself, reeking, easy and most comfortable on all fours. But even without claws that he's depicted as having, even without sharp like teeth, even if he had been beautiful, he would not have lessened the horror. His mere presence in the world was an affront to the world. Eventually, of course, a brave and fit hero named Beowulf volunteers to rid the kingdom of this demon, this pestilence. He and his task force of warriors enter the land, announce their purpose, and are welcomed with enthusiasm, generosity, and a kind of relief. And on the first night, however, following a big party, a big celebration, to rally the forces and draw their courage, the war seems won. Because when the monster appears, they suffer only one casualty before Beowulf just rips his arms off, well, one arm, sending him fatally bleeding, limping, moaning, slouching back home to his mother. We have mother. I suggested earlier that evil has no father. <laughs> but it shall not come as a surprise that Glendale has a mother. In true folkloric and epic fashion, the real bearer of evil, of destruction, is female. Monsters, it seems, are born after all. And like her sisters, Eve, Pandora, Lot's wife, Helen of Troy, and that incredible female that sits at the gate of Milton's hell, birthing vicious dogs who eat each other and are replaced by more and more litters from their mother's womb. It turns out, of course, that Grindel's mother is more repulsive and more responsible for evil than even he. Interestingly enough, she has no name. I would just love to follow those images, but I will do that at another time. In any case, this silent, repulsive female is a mother, and unlike her son, she does have a motive for murder. It's called 
called parenting. Therefore, she sets out immediately to avenge her dead son. She goes to the palace, interrupts the warriors who are having a big party because they have beaten Grendel, and she fills her, she carries a pouch, she fills it with their mangled bodies. That picture of this female in the pocketbook, full of body parts, is uh, amazing. Her vengeance instigates a second, even more determined foray by the hero, and this time on his territory, in his home. In Beowulf, our hero swims through demon-laden waters, but he's captured, and entering the mother's lair, he's weaponless, and has to use his bare hands, which he does. But he's not completely successful until suddenly, unfortunately, he grabs the sword that belongs to the mother and with her own weapon, he cuts off her head and then the head of Grendel's corpse. And an interesting thing happens at that moment. The victim's blood melts the sword. The conventional reading is that the fiend's blood is so foul, it melts steel. But the image of Beowulf standing there with a woman's head in one hand and a useless hilt in the other encourages more layered interpretations, one being that perhaps violence against violence, regardless of good and evil, right and wrong, is itself so foul, the sword of vengeance collapses in exhaustion. Well, Beowulf is a classic epic of good, vanquishing evil, of unimaginable brutality, being overcome by physical force, bravery and sacrifice, honor, pride, rewards both in reputations and wealth, all come full circle in this rousing medieval tale. And in such heroic narratives, glory is not in the details. The forces of good and evil are obvious, blatant. The triumph of the former over the latter is earned and justified and delicious. And as Beowulf says, it's always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. Contemporary society, however, is made uneasy by the concept of pure, unmotivated evil pious and unsullied virtue. And contemporary writers and scholars search for other answers, much more. And one challenge to the narrow expectations of this rousing heroic narrative, one challenge comes from a contemporary writer, the late John Gardner, in a novel he wrote entitled Grinnell. He chose to tell it from the monster or the demon's point of view. And it's a tour de force, an intellectual and aesthetic enterprise that comes very close to being the subtle voice subject of much of today's efforts to come to grips with the kind of permanent global war we now <coughs> find ourselves engaged in. The novel poses the question that the epic doesn't. Who is Grendel? And the author asks us to enter his mind and test the assumption that evil is unintelligible, wanton, and undecipherable. By assuming the demon's voice, that is the I of the novel, by assuming his point of view, Gardner begins to establish at once that unlike the character in the classic saga, Grendel is not without thought, and also he's not a beast. In fact, when we meet him, he's reflecting on true beasts. The instant the reader is introduced to him, when he's open, when the novel opens, 
Grinnell was watching a ram and he's musing, do not think my brains are squeezed shut like a ram's by the roots of horns. And then he looks at the ram's and says, why can't these creatures discover a little dignity? Well, Garner's version has the same plot, characters, etc., as the original, and relies on similar descriptions and conventions. But where Seamus Heaney's introduction to his translation of Beowulf emphasizes the movement of evil from out there to in here, the movement of evil from the margins of the world to inside the castle. <coughs> Satan not as the brilliant angel in heaven, but somebody who lives next door. And the artistic brilliance of the poem. Gardner, on the other hand, tries to penetrate the interior life, emotional life, cognizant of incarnate evil, and prioritizes the poet as the one who organizes the world's disorder, who pulls together disparate histories into meaning. We learn in Gardner's novel that Grindel distinguishes himself from the Ram that does not know or remember his past. We learn that in the beginning, Grindel is consumed by hatred and is neither proud nor ashamed of it that he is full of contempt for the survivors of his rampages, watching the men, the thanes, bury their dead. He describes the scene as follows, of this burial scene. On the side of the hill, the dirge, slow, shoveling begins. They throw up a mound for the funeral pyre, for whatever arms or legs or heads my haste has left behind. Meanwhile, he says, thinks, up in the shattered hall, the builders are hammering, replacing the door, industrious and witless as worker ants, except that they make small, foolish changes, adding a few more iron pegs more iron bands with tireless dogmatism. But the contempt he has for the survivors of his own ferocity and shamelessness and appetite, he extends to the world in general. He says in the beginning, I understood that the world was nothing, just a mechanical chaos of casual brute enmity on which we stupidly impose our hopes and fears. He says he understood that finally and absolutely I alone exist. All the rest I saw merely <coughs> as what pushes me or what I push against blindly, as blindly as all that is not myself pushes back. I create the whole universe blink by blink. But the fundamental theme of the novel lies in Grindel's possibilities. First, his encounter with shaped, studied, artistic language, as opposed to noise, groans, shouts, and boasts. And second, his dialogue with the dragon, who sits atop the mountain of gold that he has been guarding for centuries. Regarding the first, his encounter with a poet who was called the Shaper, that encounter offers him the only possibility of transformation. Grendel knows the Shaper's song is full of what he calls lies or illusion or the manipulation of facts. Mm -hmm because he has watched carefully the battles of men and knows that they are not the glory the singer turns them into. But he does succumb to the Shaper's language because of its power 
to transform, its power to elevate, to discourage base action. And he defines this potency this way. He reshapes the world, so his name implies. He stares strange-eyed at the mindless world and turns dry sticks to gold. That's his definition of the shaper. And it is because of this shaped, elevated, patterned life that Grindel is able to contemplate beauty, recognize love, feel pity, crave mercy, and experience shame. It is because of the Shaper's imagination that he considers, Grindel considers, the equation of quality with meaning. In short, he develops a desperate hunger for the life of a completely human being. My heart, he says, was light with Hrothgar's goodness and leaden with grief at my own bloodthirsty ways. Overwhelmed with these reflections on goodness and light, he goes to the hall weeping for mercy aching for community to assuage his utter, utter loneliness. And this is what he recalls. I staggered out into the open, up toward the hall with my burden, groaning out mercy, peace. The people screamed. Drunken men rushed me with battle axes. I sank to my knees, crying, friend, friend. They hacked at me, yipping like dogs. So he reverts to the deep wilderness of his hatred. Yet he is still in turmoil, torn between tears and a bellow of scorn. He travels to the dragon for answers to his own cosmic questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is the world? What is God? Is there? Brilliant debate, long, fascinating argument, loaded, of course, with the dragon's cynicism, bitterness, indifference. But he does have one word of advice for the dragon does, for Grindel. He says, get a pile of gold and sit on it. <laughs> Between Grendel's suspicion that noble language produces noble behavior, just as empty language produces empty behavior, empty uh, vacuous behavior. Between that and the dragon's view of man's stupidity, banality, and irrelevance. The dragon's denial of free will and intercession. It's right there. That's the point of the apostrophe S in the far right or so. That's where the plane on which civic, cultural, and intellectual life really rests. Because that dilemma is ours. It is the nexus between the shaper and the dragon between St. Augustine and Nietzsche, perhaps even between art and science, maybe between the Old Testament and the New, maybe between swords and blockchains. It is nevertheless a space for, as well as the act of language. It's a magnetic space, pulling us away from reaction to thinking, denying easy answers, and name-calling, and violence committed because in crisis. It's just the only thing one knows how to do. 
both of these narratives, Seamus Heaney's translation of Beowulf and John Gardner's novel, Riddell, can lead us to an additional supplementary, even complementary tale, which is the story of the foreigner and the desperate need to belong. You know, although Grindel lives within walking distance to the meat hall and was born there, he is assumed to be the foreigner. His alienness has nothing to do with birth place. As to the way he looks, his unintelligible language, Although he understands them, they don't understand him. His solitude, his estrangement from any community at all. When he cries mercy or friend, he's not only misunderstood, he's assumed to be in the same attack mode that he always was known for. And what encourages his crisis of belonging is the Shaper's song an art form, a different culture, seductively on display, making Grendel yearn for elevation toward humanness, to be at home among those for whom he once held murderous, held in murderous contempt. What enrages his victims, driving them to despair, more perhaps than their loss of precious life, is their inability to protect their home from the local, from the neighborhood destroyer, the one who comes in the garden to kill. Both rap narratives are rife with implications for the meaning of foreignness, internal, external, Meanings of home, of belonging. They opus Wolf as poem, Grindel as novel, are fertile terrains to contemplate the most serious, dangerous, perplexing problems we face. A world convulsing under the pressures of globalism, roiling and ever more violent manifestations of the definitions of home, provoking uneasiness as we are forced to come up with new answers to old questions. Who or what is a foreigner? Is it them or is it us? Where do we belong and how do we know? And just what is it that makes it matter? Beowulf's answers are stark, medieval. Gardner's voice <coughs> is modern, truant, truantly hopeful. But our answers have to be better than both. 